The passion of Torah is the passion of Jesus is the passion of Lent. A Philosophical Meditation upon Deuteronomy 26, 1 to 13. I am William Greenway, Professor of Philosophical Theology at Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary, and this is a chapter from my new book, In the Light of Agape, Moral Realism and Its Consequences, a collection of philosophical essays defending and reflecting upon the reality signified by agape, or, I would argue, by signifiers like Hesed in Judaism, Ren in Confucianism, or Metta in Buddhism. In this reflection, I argue that there is profound spiritual and ethical continuity between not only Judaism and Christianity, but also among Buddhism, Hinduism, secular humanism, Islam, and other faith traditions. I begin with a reading of the text. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground, which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket, and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time, and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number. And there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders, and he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. When you have finished paying all the tithe of your produce in the third year, which is the year of the tithe, giving it to the Levites, the aliens, the orphans, and the widows, so that they may eat their fill within your towns. Then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the sacred portion from the house, and I have given it to the Levites, the resident aliens, the orphans, and the widows, in accordance with your entire commandment that you commanded me. I have neither transgressed nor forgotten any of your commandments." Emmanuel Levinas, the celebrated 20th century philosopher, grew up as a Russian Jew in Kaunas, Lithuania, just north of Belarus and Ukraine. As a boy, he was forced to flee with his Jewish community when the Russian Revolution swept through Lithuania. As an adult French citizen and army officer, he spent five years as a captive of the Nazis and his entire immediate family, having returned to Kanaus, was murdered when the Nazis swept through Lithuania on their march into Russia. Levinas often cited a line from the Christian philosopher Blaise Pascal, 
That is my place in the sun. That is how the usurpation of the whole world began. With that line, Pascal anticipates how ethics grounded in appeals to rights would not only be insufficient for ethics, but would be appropriated to justify political and economic imperialism. The well-known first fruits passage of the Torah, Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 12, strives to counter a similar imperialistic interpretation of the promised land motif among the Israelites. By the time this text is written, the Israelite conquest of Canaan is done. There is no undoing that, no place for the Israelites to go. The question is, what will be the character of Israelite rule? The author reminds them of their treatment in Egypt, where it was the Israelites themselves who had been identified as the aliens. Are they going to rule like the Egyptians? The author reminds them that they were poor and isolated immigrants, that their father was a wandering Aramean. How are they going to treat immigrants? We know from the history of ancient Israel that the promised land motif was used to justify political and economic imperialism. This is what Jewish prophets called forgetting God, which in concrete terms means forgetting the poor, the alien, the widow, and the orphan, forgetting that God promised to bless the children of Abram, a blessing applicable to all children of Abram, so that Abram and his children could be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Our author not only proclaims in this passage what it is to remember God, but embeds the community's remembering in an annual ritual of first fruits. In this ritual, one takes not the excess, not what remains after we're sure there's enough for us, but first fruits of the harvest. Moreover, because this is not just about a once-a-year exception, but about marking out a way of living in community, the people are told to take and share not only first fruits, but a tenth of all that is harvested every third year. They are to remember God by sharing all this with the aliens in the land. Note that in the context of Deuteronomy, most of the aliens are descendants of people who lived in Canaan before the Israelite conquest. One remembers God by sharing the first fruits and the tithe, so that the alien, the fatherless, and the widow may eat in your towns and be satisfied. That is what it is to remember God. Let's pause to be sure about the reason our author is saying this. It's because they love the aliens, the widows, the orphans, and the immigrants. They cannot make people love each other, but they can remind the people of times when they themselves were needy, when they were seen as strangers in the land, and of what they thought of those who welcomed and aided them. And they can say, remember God, go and do likewise. But is this first fruits philosophy realistic? Indeed, don't we know that it is patently unrealistic? Why not assert my rights? Why not establish means and security for me and mine first? I mean, let's be real. Haven't modern philosophy and science established that that is how the world really works? That the state of nature is primordially a war of all against all? Moral idealists like our biblical author are naive and dangerous because in the real world it's a struggle for survival. And those who do not know how to play the game get eaten alive. So, go with the flow. Form strategic alliances, do long-term assessments, and work to align others' interests with your own, especially 
if they are powerful. Ideals are great if you can afford to have them. But a first fruits philosophy is insane because in the real world, people who refuse to compromise, refuse to accept reality and play the game, people who get stuck on their moral ideals, who do not play by the rules of realpolitik, in the real world, and, and this is actually true, I'm not setting this up to undo it later, this is true. In the real world, people like this get crucified. It is this hard truth that binds the Torah's first fruits passage to the crucifixion of Jesus and Lent. This connection is obscured by an understandable but massive confusion over how to understand Jesus' crucifixion and Lent a confusion most obvious in tit-for-tat understandings of the cross. For instance, in the penal substitutionary understanding of atonement, penal substitutionary theory claims that on the cross, Jesus paid the penalty for sin in our place. I say this confusion is understandable because not just among Christians, but in religions around the world, one finds a primordial conviction that the only hope of making up for evil is if, in a tit-for-tat exchange, some equally great evil is done in return. Accordingly, one finds sacrificial rituals in religious traditions across the world where one does harm to oneself or to another creature to make up for some other evil. Tragically, this just increases harm in the world and compounds the offense. This point about the confusion of substitutionary understandings of the cross deserves more careful and compassionate discussion than I commit, can commit to here. But let me stress that even people who articulate such theories of atonement have, insofar as they have indeed found forgiveness, they have found forgiveness in divine grace, which substitutionary atonement theories misunderstand. Womanist theologians like Dolores Williams and Joanne Marie Terrell have been particularly important in awakening us to the problematic ways in which substitutionary understandings of atonement sanctify and even glorify suffering itself, suffering for the sake of suffering. They have awakened us to the way in which substitutionary tit-for-tat understandings lead us confusedly to think that somehow perpetuating new evil, the infliction of pain or killing, will undo past evil. Such understandings of atonement lead Christians to see God as somehow pleased or satisfied with Jesus' suffering and death on the cross pleased with the suffering and death itself. This is manifest when people are asked, what does the passion of Passion Week and the passion of the passion of Jesus refer to? And they answer, the cross, the suffering and death of Jesus on the cross. There are two confusions here it is especially vital for us to name and correct. First, there is nothing inherently good about suffering, pain, and unjust death. Nothing good about the suffering, pain, and unjust death of Jesus. Second, the God who is love did not delight in the suffering, pain, and unjust death of Jesus, and does not delight in the suffering, pain, and unjust death of of anyone else. But then precisely what is the passion of Passion Week? The passion of Passion Week is the passion of Jesus, the passion of agape, of agape incarnate, the passion of agape so perfectly incarnate in Jesus that Jesus remained true to this passion 
to agape for every face to the death, even death on a cross. It is vital to realize that the cross was a horrifying form of execution used by imperial Rome to terrorize subjugated populations into submission. As theologian Merritt Trollstead notes, in 4 BCE, the Romans simultaneously crucified 2,000 Jews suspected of rebellion. Mass crucifixions of Jews continued through and beyond Jesus' time numbering into the tens of thousands. The civil and ecclesial authorities did not execute Jesus so that humanity's sins might be forgiven, to appease God, or as some sort of bloody payment in a tit-for-tat economy. Jesus was executed because he lived surrender to having been seized by love for all the faces that surrounded him. And so he spoke clearly and forthrightly about that which was loving and good, and against what was unloving and evil. Jesus thereby threatened powerful figures and systems of exploitation and oppression, and as precisely as one would expect in a fallen, selfish, and violent world, those figures and systems responded to the threat by crucifying him. Jesus did not falter. The triumph manifest in the cross is the triumph of surrender to the passion of having been seized by love even in the face of massive imperial power and the threat of imminent torture and death. It is the triumph of faith, of fidelity to agape, fidelity to the God who is love over desire for personal well-being and survival. In Jesus' fidelity to having been seized by love for every face that surrounded him, even unto death on a cross, we see in the words of Emmanuel of Anas, a man who in the passion of agape was led to fear injustice more than death, to prefer to suffer than to commit injustice, and to prefer that which justifies being over that which assures it. God did not delight in the suffering and murder of Jesus. God delighted in Jesus' fidelity to love for all faces, fidelity to the passion of agape, fidelity to the love of neighbor, which is the love of God, even unto a cross. The idea that Lent or Passion Week are about the suffering and death of Jesus in and of themselves tames Lent, domesticates it by neutralizing its social critique. Christians can think of this in very practical terms. If you give something up for Lent that is not directly tied to justice for some neighbor, if giving up something simply creates suffering, if it is not about living surrender to having been seized by agape for some other face, then you have missed out on the joy and truth of participating in the passion of Jesus Christ. There is a debate in New Testament studies over how to translate pistios, or faith, in relation to Jesus Christ. Are Christians called to have faith in Jesus Christ or to have the faith of Jesus Christ? That's the debate. But these are false alternatives. For to have faith in Jesus Christ is to have the faith of Jesus Christ, is to share in the passion of Jesus Christ. That is the passion Christians like me should remember and recommit ourselves to when we break the bread and drink the cup. That is the passion of Lent, the passion of Passion Week, the passion of Jesus, the passion for justice, the passion for neighbor, the passion of sheep who clothe the feet naked, feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, care for the sick, visit those imprisoned, the passion of good Samaritans, the passion of kenosis, of incarnation, of Christmas, the passion of Isaiah and Amos and Micah, the passion of Bodhisattvas, of Siddhartha, of Gandhi, of Lavanas, the passion behind the five pillars of Islam, 
the passion which experiences this veil of tears as dukkha, a burning, and it is the passion of the first fruits philosophy of the Torah. It is also a passion systemically elided from the categories of modern rationality and absent from the rooms where it happens across the globe to devastating effect. Just for starters, everyone with this passion would have joined with South African Anglican Archbishop Bishop Thabo Makoba back in 2021 when he accused the U.S. and E.U. of COVID vaccine, vaccine apartheid, COVID-19 vaccine apartheid, for their long-standing denial of patent waivers and threats to punish any countries who infringed upon patents for COVID vaccines. A first fruits philosophy would have insisted upon patent waivers and would have would have us ask not just about first fruits, but about third and fourth fruits, whether or not it was moral for we in the United States to get second and third doses of COVID vaccine, while U.S. foreign policy was by design denying vaccine to millions of poor people across the globe. And this is just for starters. All of this is connected to what has happened in Hong Kong, in Ukraine, in the Northern Triangle, to the plight of refugees at the U.S.-Mexico border, to the withering of the Arab Spring, to the school-to-prison pipeline, and on and on. For a brilliant assessment of the problematic geopolitical dynamics, and also for realistic suggestions for redress, see Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si. Let me close with some thoughts about how Christians might celebrate Ash Wednesday and Lent. Thoughts which connect Lent to the Torah's first fruits philosophy. First, consistent with Deuteronomy 26's emphasis upon the alien and the impoverished, it seems Lenten celebrations should attempt to include, or at least explicitly to name and remember, those who are alien to their communities. People from other faith traditions, other ethnicities, races, or socioeconomic classes, especially those who are poor. Lent should not be a most exclusive season, a season just for Christians, but a most inclusive season, a season for those from any tradition who surrender to the passion of Lent. Second, consistent with the Torah's first fruits philosophy, especially as it is realized in the passion of Jesus, who spoke love to power even unto the cross, both individually and communally, giving up something for Lent should involve naming and committing time, social and political capital, and money to redressing some injustice, some violation of the poor or those considered alien. If you are poor or in powerless, this might mean embodying the passion of Jesus by offering a word of encouragement or a gesture of love. What distinguishes simple self-deprivation from true Lenten sacrifice, from participation in the faith of Jesus Christ, participation in the passion of Jesus Christ, is this. True Lenten sacrifice is self-deprivation or risk, which is directly related in word or deed to the love of God, which is love of neighbor, to the passion of Lent. For the most privileged of us, this should probably involve speaking love to power. Two closing thoughts. First, all this means that the Lenten season is continuous with the Advent and Christmas seasons. Those who give up something for the sake of giving something up during Lent miss out on the joy of giving something up out of love for others, on giving rooted in surrender to the gracious love of God, miss out on a way of participating in the love of God. When one's giving is rooted in surrender to agape, it feels like a blessed opportunity, not like giving something up. So Lent is simultaneously a joyous season of giving 
like Advent and Christmas, and with its termination in the cross, ultra-realistic about the character of this world. But this world does not triumph. Surrender to having been seized by agape for every face, surrender to the passion of Lent, the passion of Jesus, brings profound joy in this world despite its crosses and yields resilience. We are not ignorant of the reality and power of real-world social, economic, and political dynamics, but we neither see them as true to the ultimate character of reality, nor do we surrender to them. Second, full surrender in true Lenten celebration yields palpable, palpable communion with agape, which enfolds us and holds us and lifts us up. Communion in the passion of Lent, communion in our shared surrender to agape, is so powerful and glorious that it instills in us reasonable hope that somehow it is not this world, but agape, that has the ultimate word. In other words, it is from true participation in the passion of Lent that Easter hope is born. We Christians are mistaken if we endure Lent so we can get Easter. If someone does something for the sake of some heavenly reward, then ultimately they are doing it for the reward, for themselves not out of living surrender to agape. It is true celebration of Lent, that is, full surrender to the passion of Lent, to the passion of Jesus, to the passion of the prophets, to the passion of the Bodhisattvas and Siddhartha and the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It is full surrender to passion for all creatures of every kind, especially those who are needy, suffering or in pain. It is full surrender to that passion, to agape, hesed, meta, ren, that gives birth to Easter hope, to hope in heaven, nirvana, or the pure land, to the hope that in some unimaginable way, agape is the ultimate word for each one of us. Get this backwards. Ground everything in the promise of some heavenly reward, and one will miss the joy of communion with the God who is gracious. Jesus was executed because he lived surrender to having been seized by love for all faces. Surrender to have... The civil and ecclesial authorities did not execute Jesus so that humanity's sins might be forgiven, to appease God, or as some sort of bloody payment in a tit-for-tat economy. Okay, you gotta go. Okay. I know, you gotta go. Uh, where can you go? Go out there, okay? Go, go, go. Sorry. All right.